Thanks for coming to one of the latest of our talks for our NASA series. Um, today we have Dr. Dave Korsmeyer, am I saying it correctly? Um, yep. He mentioned when we walked in that he probably used to work with 20 to 30 current Googlers, so, so you may know mm -hmm. him already. Um, Dave is the Director of Engineering at NASA Ames. He was previously the Chief of NASA Ames Intelligence Systems Division. He led the Near-Earth Object Mission Concept Studies for NASA, directly supported President Obama's 2009 Human Space Flight Review, and was part of the Human Space Flight Architecture Team's Technology Panel. Dave received his BS in Aerospace Engineering from Penn State, his MS and PhD in Astrodynamics from the University of Texas at Austin. Oh, no. We got some fans back here. It's <laughs> a lot of schooling. Yeah. Yeah, back. Couldn't get enough. Yeah. Uh, Dave is also a Sloan Fellow with a Master's in Business, Administ business Management from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Um, without further ado, here is Dave Korsmeyer. Um, after, we're going to leave some time for questions, and we do ask that you use the microphone over here when you ask the questions so people on the live stream can hear. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I am addicted to schooling, so just that's my own personal foible with apologies. Um, thanks, everybody, for showing up. I'm either your afternoon after lunch talk or your after lunch nap. If you're going to nap, do it quietly, right? So drool with the best of intentions. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, these little babies to some degree. And let's start because I find hands-on stuff gives you something to do. Take a look at these, pass them around, and then occasionally listen to what I'm saying. Uh, what's going on is actually a disruption in, our, in my industry. Uh, my industry is aerospace, is uh, space missions in particular. And what we've got is we've got a new, not so new, but new to NASA form factor called uh, CubeSats. Um, and what exactly is a CubeSat? We used to call them nanosats, and then that just didn't sound cool enough, so everybody calls them CubeSats. Uh, it actually came out as a university concept. Stanford and Cal Poly came up with it. Uh, 1U is a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter cube. Think four inches square for those of you still on Imperial. Um, and that qualifies as a U, a unit. So if you look on your left, or uh, you've got 1U. That's what you're holding right now. Um, and 3U is linear, three of them put together. 6U is a two by three by one box. Think of a toaster oven, okay? Those are the common denominator sizes for what we call CubeSats these days. So even though a 6U is 6U, we still call it a CubeSat. You see why I like NanoSat, but I'm not the guy that gets to set these things. Uh, you'll notice as you pass these around also the weight, the com comparable weight of these things. Uh, the one over here on the side is probably about a full kilo and a half. That's probably about 500 grams, right? So the range of these is we'll pack them as dense as we can because it is actually the volume that is constraining us, and I'll tell you a little bit of why about that in a minute. So when you think of NASA and you think of mission types, um, I came across this analogy, and I kind of like it. There's three types, right? There's the grandfather clock, which is big and fancy, elegant, expansive, handcrafted, you have to have a team of experts, takes years to build, takes experts to repair. Think of the International Space Station, right? Manned missions are like that. We can do them, they're beautiful, they're phenomenal. Everyone wants them in their house, few people can afford it. Then we got Swiss clocks. Those are those cool things that sit on your parents' mantle. They're nice, they're very expensive, they're handcrafted, built by a bunch of really sharp people off in Switzerland, do great things. They also are very expensive, but are smaller and more efficient. Think of our robotic science. Think of the Mars rovers for that, okay? Now that traditionally has been what NASA's been able to do. That's what we do. There's, again, this disruption. We're getting into the point where the available commercial grade, consumer grade technologies are able to fulfill space missions for us, um, now at a much greatly reduced cost, which means we can do a lot more of them, and that's the quartz watches. Think the Swatch, right? If you guys are young or old enough to remember that, <clears throat> I do, unfortunately, mass produced. Now, I know nobody has watches. I could have said the cell phone, and it would have been just fine, and I probably will change it out. Um, but they have actually much more limited functionality, where the functionality is enabled in software versus actual the hardware. 
um, and you can mass produce them to some degree, or they are available uh, made out of mass produced components. And that's what CubeSats are, and that's what they're supposed to be. And NASA's coming to terms with what are we going to do with that? Because that's a different model, a different perspective for how we've done space exploration in the past. One of the things we have done is we've created a thing called the CubeSat Launch Initiative. This actually started as an educational outreach model, where, as I said, the, the, this form factor uh, came out of the university basis. Sounds good. You're going to build a satellite. Wonderful. You put that together in some senior design class or graduate degree class or whatever you've done. Now what? How do you get it into space? You're going to build your own launch vehicle? Mm, OK, that's still a little bit harder than, than the average bear can pull off. So what happens is it turns out that there's a bunch of agencies, uh, DOD being one, NASA being one, a huge one, um, our intelligent agencies, and commercial launch that launch into space all the time. There's, there's launches every couple weeks, actually. If you go online, you can, you can just Google it, and you will see that there literally are launches all the time. The interesting thing about those launches is they aren't full. Why? Because you're designing these big spacecraft, either a commercial telecom bird that's relaying the internet around, or DISH, or whatever, or you know exploration missions that we've got on NASA, and you design with a 10, 15% margin, because you really don't know what's going to happen. So what happens when you've delivered to the pad, you end up and you've got this big fairing, and you've got this little teeny spacecraft, and you've got this big launch rocket, and you've got this little teeny spacecraft, and you've probably got a couple tens to hundreds to thousands of kilograms of extra mass you could throw into space, and several cubic meters of space you could throw into space. Okay, a volume, I mean, you could throw up into space. So what they came up with was the idea that by standardizing on this form factor, you could create little dispensers that you would mount in the launch vehicles, and they would be called secondary payloads. Okay, and so you would just show up. The big launcher would show up, the big spacecraft would show up, and the university student would show up with their small satellite and say, okay, not, not literally the day of, but, you know, six months ahead, say, and say, OK, I want to ride. I know mine is this size, is this volume, behaves in this way, and you can stick it in your launcher. And after you deploy the main satellite, you can pop this off. So it's a free ride. That works so well. This CubeSat launch initiative has basically started signing up people, started in 2009, and has been progressively going. As I said, it's, it's a simple matter of you design the spacecraft, you build it. Uh, this dispenser here is called a P-Pod. It can handle up to three, this one right here, can handle up to three 1U CubeSats. The 1U CubeSats are, are just that, they're kind of toys. Uh, if you, by the time you put in any instrumentation or any actual tools that are of value to the engineering or science or technical community, you really need like 3U of volume, which is, say, a small toaster. Uh, and we are getting to a point where we're commonly flying 6U of volume, which is a toaster oven. So you put it in the uh, known dispenser, which has already got all the mountings. You launch it off. Um, it deploys once in space. And then the students or a NASA center can communicate with the spacecraft and get the science or technology demonstration or engineering done. Um, it became a very viable model. Now, what kind of happened is the students in the university started doing that and were doing great stuff. They were getting really good technical papers out of it. And frankly, the NASA guys said, hey, there's something going on here. Um, look at all these people that are making use of it. We've got, from 2009 to 14, we uh, did, I think, six uh, CLSI selections. And we've made 114 selections for 114 different satellite systems that universities are going to deploy. Um, and lined them up and told them when they're going to fly. Uh, and so they're off and running. NASA decided, well, there's something wrong with that. We're, we're missing out. Because look at the numbers. There's uh, a huge number of proposals, 150, but we select over 2 thirds of them, 109. Uh, we've only flown a fifth of them right now, say, or a third of those selected, 34. And we've got another 14 manifested. So. There's a lot coming online. There's a lot happening. Uh, and we realized 
that we're not alone. This is a different view. Again, forgive it's a NASA chart, so there's acronyms everywhere. Take the following out of it. The rightmost column here is the number of CubeSats being deployed as a secondary, as, as extra volume, on a mainline mission. The CLSI moniker here are the ones that NASA helps sponsor. The other ones, like, say, International Space Station, right, which has got NanoRacks, a commercial company that kind of spun out of doing some NASA business, now launches 28 CubeSats a pop. Actually, more than 28, 48 um, CubeSats a pop uh, on their dispenser up off of the International Space Station. So there's a huge volume that doesn't come through NASA, it goes up through other means on other launch vehicles and does excellent work. Now, again, what does this give you? Why would, why would NASA care about something like this? It's supposed to be an educational activity. It's something that trains up engineers and scientists. You know, it's STEM. Why, do we, why does NASA care? Well, turns out we stumbled across there's really easy frequent access to space. A lot more than people think. Getting a launch, I can get anybody who wants to build a CubeSat here a launch in six months to a year. Not a problem. I can get you a ride. Very easy frequent access to space. Uh, it gives you the ability to basically rapidly respond to a mission you want to do. Right now, if you do a mainline NASA mission or a mainline NOAA weather mission or a DOD something, you're starting on a three to five year journey. Hands down. Easy. And that's after you've won the proposal. Okay? It's going to take you three to five years to actually put together the science, the spacecraft, do all your design, all your engineering, all your analysis, go through the long paperwork process that will pretty much guarantee you a successful mission, but it's going to take you five years. You're, you're biting a big hunk of your life on any given mission. If you just want to do some quick and dirty analysis, do some easy uh, measurements, do some rapid response type uh, technology demonstrations, this is tremendously much more interesting because we're talking a cycle time of say 18 to 36 months, maybe one and a half to three years of the whole life cycle of coming up with the idea, flying it, and then getting the analysis back. A lot quicker time cycle. If you want to refly it, we've done reflights in six months where we've designed, built it, flown it, went, ah, that didn't work quite right, changed a piece on backup hardware, rebuilt it again, and flown it again. So we get a very rapid response. And frankly, these are relatively low cost missions. Now, <clears throat> again, I work for the government. So relatively low cost missions is just that. Uh, it's on the order of a million or two, okay? Uh, sometimes 10 million for the non-recurring engineering if you're designing something for the first time. For a university though, they can build you know, a 50K to 100K. Now that's a lot for a university, I yield but they can build that class of a spacecraft, get it launched in somebody's master's degree program, get the data back, and allow them to graduate. That's pretty impressive. And then you actually get a whole set of, a whole class of people out to graduate. So what happened is, NASA woke up to this. Uh, Aviation Week, which is one of those great trade magazines that's particular to my uh, uh, genre, um, came out and said, whoa, look out, small satellites, um, doing more with less. You notice this small one right here is one we built at NASA Ames. We actually deployed it. It was the first uh, uh, US CubeSat deployed off of the space station. And we just did that back in uh, 2012. October 4th, 2012, we deployed it. So what NASA is doing is realizing this is a, a, an opportunity to do different things in different form factors for less. Now, what's NASA's mission? Just to rehash for you people that you know, don't read our strategic plan every day. We're here to do science. We're here to do technology development. We're here to do uh, exploration of the solar system. And we're here to do basically public outreach, STEM, right? Science, technology, education, uh, engineering, and math. That's part of what our, uh, your tax dollars are doing. That's why you're paying me to do this. It turns out that NASA Ames, fortuitously, um, we were the first one to um, jump on this bandwagon, in part because we're one of the smaller research centers, uh, in part because we had some people that worked with the Stanford and Cal Poly groups that came up with this standard, and in part because we were just lucky, dumb luck. Um, 
So right now, we actually lead uh, NASA as an agency in doing small and nanosat missions. And you'll see that we're actually uh, getting into more and more of it as time goes on. One of the things uh, you can see from this chart, it was a slow start. And again, NASA vernacular is we all have to come up with a cool name. And CubeSat uh, semantics means you have to have sat at the end of your name. Uh, with apologies. So we have gene sat and pharma sat, um, nano sale, there's a sale involved, right? Okay. You can kind of get all these tech ed sat, kick sat, ecamp sat. Um, we started off slow. 2006 was the first peer review science publication satellite that NASA did. Now, why does that matter? Na NASA is a science and engineering organization. Our reason for existing is promulgating good science and engineering about aerospace science, space technology, et cetera. What says that something is of value is having a published paper in a peer review journal. That's what matters, right? For other people, it's money. For NASA, our currency is citations, right? Google Scholar is great. Go find your citations, right? That's what we live on. So getting peer review publishable science out of small CubeSats has been a huge change for NASA. And it's been a huge change for the rest of the US government space industry. So we're doing a whole bunch. You can see as time goes by, we're paying out more and more and more. Um, my organization is the engineering organization at NASA Ames. And that's pretty much what we spend our time doing. Um, this and larger small satellites like LADEE and LCROSS and other things that have recently been and around the moon. <clears throat> so let me tell you about some of the different areas of particular scientific and engineering interests that we're involved in that are making use of, again, this form factor. Um, one of the things we work on uh, specifically at, at NASA Ames is space biology. Now, what's the difference between life sciences and space biology? And Okay, let me tell you. Um, when we say life sciences, normally in NASA we talk about how the astronauts work and breathe and do great stuff on the International Space Station. That's great. That's kind of being a medical doctor, tracking them, finding clinically what makes them good, you know, how to manage their allergies in space or whatever. Space biology is actually understanding the function of how a biological system operates in microgravity, zero gravity, and a high radiation environment. Again, why do we care about that? Well, guess what? We are in the best possible protective bubble you could ever imagine here on the planet Earth. We've got this great big rock underneath us that gives us the gravity, okay? We've got this wonderful thick, not that thick, but relatively thick atmospheric shell, and we've got a molten core of a planet that is spinning to give us this huge magnetic bubble so that we are protected from all the alpha and beta particles, most of them anyway, that come flying out of the sun and coming from the cosmic background radiation. It turns out we're a great place for life to exist. Go look outside, it's a beautiful day, lots of life. Do we know, this is a question, this is a quiz. You can know the answer, right? Do we know whether life can exist elsewhere? Do we know? Anybody, anybody? All right, I'll leave it for the people online to vote. Um, no, we don't know, we suspect, absolutely, but we do not know, okay? What we do know is that we can do two things. We can send people to the moon for about seven days and they won't croak immediately. And we can have six astronauts live in orbit for about a year long and they won't croak immediately. Do we know that you can put up a plant and have it actually grow, flower, fertilize the flower, drop a seed, germinate and grow another plant? Guess what, we don't know. We don't know that. Do we know that we can send out brewer's yeast out past the Earth magnetic bubble and the yeast will actually propagate, grow, live, die, and create all that lo lovely uh, yeasty smell you get when you make bread. Do we know that? No, we don't know that. We know so incredibly little about how life will actually exist outside of our pr protective bubble. This is why we do this. So it turns out nanosats were made for this. CubeSats were made for this. These are perfect. We do these little things basically like about this big, little microfluidic uh, systems, little pumps, little wells, 
little drip lines. Of course, we have to adapt for the fact that you're in zero G or micro G. And all of these systems are custom built to basically grow different types of bacteria, different types of yeast, sea monkeys, you name it. We, we've done it and we're doing it all. Spores, we have this little spinning zero G artificial variable G disk that does spore things. We do E. coli stuff. Great things, fascinating science. And because it's so poorly understood, a wonderful venue for us to do exploration activities in. And it works out really well that the CubeSats, which please don't take them home, um, give them back to me, uh, are, are really a good venue and a good opportunity to do this science in. One of the other areas we work on is we've got this really big, expensive, fancy, multi-billion dollar system up there called the Space Station. Right? We just gave it the thumbs up for another hmm, five years. Probably it'll go another eight years after that. So 2020 is the baseline. It'll probably go to 2028. And then what do we do? I don't know. But we've got a big space station up there. Space station has gone from kind of being the building you built to now being the research lab that you're trying to stock. And so lots and lots of different science activities, material science, biological science, some of the stuff I talked about before, uh, life science, um, all sorts of things, crystal uh, growth, and then a whole bunch of actual uh, space science are going on up there. It turns out one of the things that is very hard to do right now is either A, getting up to space station, or B, getting back from space station. Okay, so when you get up to space station, everyone understands that. That's hard, you gotta get on a rocket. Right now we're buying Russian stuff. We're hopefully gonna buy our own stuff soon. Getting back, how do you get something back from space? Right now, you basically can take something that's about the size of these three chairs, you cram three people in them, and you give them each about 10 kilos they can hold onto their chest, and that's how they come back. That's how the astronauts come back. That's return. Return's what they held in their hands. So we're talking very little volume returns. And how often do they return? They return about once every six months, three to six months. So if you want something down from station, you're not going to get it. What do they do? They flash freeze it. They literally have flash freezers up there. They flash freeze it, or they just put it to the side, and they wait. So there's a driving need to get what we call down mass. How do you get something down from the space station? Well, it turns out again, for the mysteriously now lost CubeSats, um, they're a great form factor for that. We've started doing deployments off the International Space Station and doing what we call an exobreak. An exobreak is a fancy way of saying Mary, Pop Mary Poppins uh, you know, umbrella. right? You pop uh, a chute, you increase the area and the very tenuous atmosphere up there slows you much more rapidly than if you were a small, you know, relatively dense box, okay? So the idea is we're going through this process to get what we want is down, uh, what we call down mass on demand. It's not that sexy sounding, but that's what it is. So the idea is if, you know, astronaut gets sick, something's going on, they draw a vial of blood, they pop it in the system, they throw it overboard, it falls down and lands in your backyard, they run into the you know, hospital and they check it out, right? That's the vision. That's kind of the, the nominal vision. It also goes for, there's um, different companies that we've been talking to for a long period of time about doing biological testing, grow, growing crystallography, et cetera. And one of the big hangups has been, well, great, now you got my stuff, how do you get it down? There's no safe way for me to get my stuff that I did on space station down. This is a way to address that. Turns out there's some other interesting ap uh, applications for that that I'll talk about later. But that's another area that Ames is deeply involved in and uh, doing a lot of work in. This is a, a nice picture, actually one of my favorite pictures, of, uh, let's see, this one. This one is TechEdSat, which is uh, the first US satellite that was launched out of the International Space Station. We, we did it at Ames. And in the background, what you see actually is the largest structure NASA's built, which is the International Space Station. That is one quarter of one fourth of one array that powers the International Space Station. So that's about a football field square, and, you've, and that's a real picture. It's not even good Photoshop. Um, after they deploy, they just they, they, they have to float in front of the array. So that's some of NASA's smallest missions with some of NASA's largest missions. Um, Pretty cool looking stuff. What we do actually 
is there's a little airlock on the, on the Japanese side. It's called the GEM module. What a surprise. Japanese environmental module or something. And uh, the Japanese uh, uh, allow everybody to make use of it. And so we load up these uh, deployers. And the Japanese have got a robotic arm, grabs the deployer, hangs it over the side at a certain angle, and then pops it out. Um, this was TechEdSat 3, uh, 3P, that we actually launched uh, just this past fall, which was the first um, 3U, volume, 3U volume, uh, deployed from the International Space Station. And here, I'm going to try. OK. That's it. It's, it's that exciting. <clears throat> but that's all it really is. It's not a, it's not, there's not a gas canister. There's not a rocket engine. It's spring-loaded. They take the thing. They cock it in. It latches. They put the lid down. They put a, um, a deployment pin on it. And that's where you go. OK, now that here there's two, two 3U dispensers. What NanoRax, uh, the company, has done is they've taken um, six times, four times six, no, no, eight times six. They've taken um, six U linear, so a three U and then another three U behind it, and they've got eight tubes. And that actually is just the right dimensions. It can also sneak through the Japanese module and hang over the side, and they deploy them all at once. The first deployment of that was also this past fall. There's a company uh, in the Bay Area called Planet Labs which happens to be a, a, in part a spin out from NASA Ames, that is deploying a whole bunch of spacecraft off the International Space Station. Um, so, you know, we've, uh, we've already been lapped to some degree. Was that uh, real speed? Or? That was real speed. That's what it looks like. It's just pop and go. And then, believe it or not, you saw how fast it was going? Uh, the rule for NASA is you're not allowed to turn on for 45 minutes after deployment from station, because they want you way the heck away from station by the time you turn on. So they're, they're really giving you a very clear field. Um, but yeah, that's as fast as it goes, and you'll get pretty far in 45 minutes. Right? Um, so the other thing we're doing is actually the things in your hand. So the lighter one, which is again roaming around somewhere, take a look inside. Somebody take a look inside. Who's got that one? Somebody put it down. Ooh, come on, somebody. All right, here. Yeah, I'm sorry? Yeah, exactly. So um, I am here at Google, right? So it, it turns out that uh, one of our guys had uh, several, several of our guys actually had a clever idea. And they said, you know, a spacecraft isn't that complex. You need, you need a, a, a little bit of a computation. You need some uh, data handling. Uh, you need some calm capability. Uh, you need a good long-lived battery. It needs to be compact and you know good volume constraints. Able to handle a good thermal regime. And I don't know. What do you think? And one of them went, "Hey." And I'm sorry, this was pre these things. It was a it was a BlackBerry. And they said, "Hey, we could fly a BlackBerry. Why not just fly one of these damn things, right?" <laughs> um, and yes, so we did. We took it on. Um, you can see in here. Literally, there is. A Nexus S uh, on its side, actually um, diagonal, because that was it just so happens to fit. I don't know if you guys did that deliberately. And then a whopping load of batteries, because it turns out International Space Station at the time did not allow us to fly lithium batteries. So we had to go with NICAD. So we had to strip out the battery. But literally the screen's in here, right, and everything else. And, and we've flown three of these babies. OK? And yeah, they work. They work. And what was the point? It was a bit of a technolo technology stunt, but it was to make the point to the community and to NASA that you really can make use of consumer-grade mass-produced technologies and get a decent behavior out of them. So what we did with, after we did this one, is we did, where's the other one? We did uh, PhoneSat 2. So can you see a Nexus in there? No, you should not be able to. Um, and B, you should notice that there's solar cells all around it. What we actually did is we cracked the case on that one, took the screen off, we don't need it, got down to the, uh, the small board, um, actually had to float the, uh, the um, uh, cell, cell phone chip off, because they really didn't want that on or connected in any way, shape, or form, and then wired in the rest of our avionics. 
that worked relatively well. Uh, lessons learned, there's a reason that a cell phone board is in a cell phone case because those little boards are the most fragile, uh, uh, touchy things in the friggin' world, right? So that's a lesson learned, right? It, they were just a pain in the ass. And where did we get these Nexus S's? Anybody have an idea? We bought them mass produced from Google? No, uh, we went to Best Buy. And we, <laughs> we got there early and when they were having a, a big sale and we bought uh, a bunch of boxes. That's, that's exactly what we did. So. Uh, we flew a whole bunch of phone set uh, ones. We flew uh, two beta, which was we had it half-assed put together and we had a launch, so we just flew what we had. Um, a 2.4 and a 2.5, don't ask why. We named them that way. Uh, and some of them just went up. The latest one just went up in April. Um, we cracked the Android kernel, did a lot of good fun stuff uh, um, to make it all work together. And we've used it also as the core for some larger CubeSats. Right? Um, it was functional enough that it was like, eh, this kind of works. We can make use out of this. We started turning it into additional CubeSats. One of them is you think these were disruptive. As we came up, we didn't come up with an idea. A, a, a guy at Cornell uh, came up with these things called chipsets. So just when you think you're safe, um, on the top is a, is a phone set. On the bottom is a uh, 3D printed deployment mechanism that we built at NASA Ames. Um, and it's going to deploy 104 of these chipsets, which are 2.5 centimeters by 2.5 centimeters square, which has got a little magnetometer and a little gyroscope and a little radar, radio, and a solar cell and a microcontroller. And it's going to pop these babies out. To what end, you say? Well, it turns out that. One of the interesting things about space and atmospheric sciences, and basically everything we do, um, is you don't want to take a point measurement. A singular point measurement at one instance in time, at one location, will tell you one point. What you want is you really want a field measurement, right? So if you watch geologists out in the field or a biologist or somewhere else, they're going to take a point here, note where they are, go over here, take a measurement, note where they are. They're going to take a field measurement to get a a distribution of a bunch of measurements across a region. How do you do that in space? Well, as you whip along in around orbit, that's great. Another way is to deploy a whole bunch of sensors. This gives you a, a means to deploy a bunch of very interesting sensors. And let's see if I can do this again. Yep. So when it's up there, it'll get itself stabilized after being deployed from station. A spring will release. And these babies will just pop out and drive all the uh, space tracking people crazy. <laughs> and I, we really did. We showed this to the, it's called JSPOC, the Joint uh, Strategic Program for whatever, that tracks stuff in lower. They have no idea how they're going to track stuff like that. I mean, it really is hard. Yes, sir? What is the altitude of those launches? About 425 to 450 kilometers. It's a very short lifetime. So you've noted one thing. How do we stop these beautiful little toys from being really annoying space junk? Uh, number one is we launch them real low. So their lifetime is measured sometimes in weeks, uh, at the longest maybe a year. Um, we have launched ones that are higher, up 650, 700, 800 kilometers. They can last two, three years up there. Um, and so you have to make sure then that you've got tracking capability. Because they really are so small, it's hard for the, the radar systems that do track this stuff to actually see them. So we're actually putting little transponders on them to squawk, uh, to tell you what's going on. But this is a great system. You can see, um, if you want to measure the upper atmosphere, these things literally flutter down and squawk as they go. Yes, sir? So I was just... You'd like to say that it doesn't, but it does. It really does. Um, we found out, as an example, that the phones are uh, highly susceptible to certain types of upsets. Um, and they're highly susceptible to electrostatics when they're out of their box. Right? That's why, again, they're in these lovely little boxes that are nicely shielded and grounded and everything's good. You take them out, and they become much more susceptible. The thermal regimes we're talking about here are we're talking minus 100 degrees uh, centigrade right, to positive 100 degrees centigrade. Right. These things are designed really well. 
but not for that every 90 minutes for the entirety of their life, right? It wears on them. So while there's a lot of good stuff out there, I don't think you can literally buy from Best Buy and fly it and consider that a functional model. However, you can, with some minor tweaks, do some selections to the stuff you buy, test to find the very robust components that you want to make use of, and fly those. That's what we've been able to do. So here's a, just a picture version of it in case the video didn't work. <clears throat> so another thing we're doing, and again, this is, we actually used the elements of the phone sat stuff. Um, we built a uh, um, little stability motors. It's called attitude determination control system. But these are little teeny motors that, you know, you think when a motor turns on, it gives you a little bit of torque. Right, you put three of them perpendicular and you get a torque that control what position you're in. Instead of going out and buying expensive uh, control motors, we actually got dental motors, the type that you get when you get a root canal. Those little motors have a lot of torque and take a little bit of power and spin up very, very quick. We actually built a swarm of satellites. Um, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that this is the first actual swarm that NASA's ever done. And what's the difference in my mind between a swarm and a constellation? A constellation is just a number, n number of satellites that are out there, and they're all kind of the same type of satellite. That's easy. It's a constellation. You're a constellation of people. A swarm is when I talk to you, and you make damn sure you talk to everybody and then report back to me. That's a swarm. So I'm treating a set as if it's a unit. Okay? What we're building is, what we've built actually is a swarm. And we're doing a bunch of uh, basically uh, radio, radio physics uh, measurements in the upper atmosphere. Uh, we've already built them, and they're launching later this uh, fall. Here's a picture uh, in our labs at Ames. Uh, these are the Edison. Um, don't ask what it stands for, but it's basically the Edison uh, demonstration of space networking. And we built eight that we're going to fly. We have four backup units. And then we built another two just for giggles that we're going to throw off the space station about the same time just to see how it all works. Um, but this is, a, again, it's kind of like that chipset model I told you about or that you just saw in the little video, except a little bit bigger. We can have more power. You can have more functionality. You can have more instrumentation. What is the yellow measuring tape for? Ah, OK. So yeah, the yellow measuring tape is, is uh, uh, this was discovered by the, the first students that actually did CubeSats. Um, you need something that is malleable because you want it to fit in a, a finite box, but you want to have a way to get, I don't know, an antenna out there. It turns out that if you look at what that yellow piece of uh, metal is, it's actually a tape measure, right? We went to Home Depot or Osh, take your pick, or Lowe's or whoever, um, you buy a bunch of tape measures, you cut them up. They work phenomenally well as antenna if you cut them to the right size. And then they wrap very closely to the body of the spacecraft and they add a little bit of extra twing when it pops out and imparts a little torque as it goes. So um, even though we've replaced a lot of the other consumer grade stuff, the, the, the Home Depot tape measures are really hard to beat when it comes to antennas. <laughs> they, they really are, I mean for certain types. Not for everything. And so we just happen to have, on this set, we have two antennas, right? And part of it is because we want to have one always pointing to ground, and one is going to be pointing, hopefully, to another one of the satellites in the swarm. OK, how do you launch these swarms, as an example? Well, I showed you, and I should have, I should have really uh, given you a better picture of it. There's these 3 up pod, what they called them, um, dispensers. And I told you about that in the NASA launch vehicles or any launch vehicle, you tend to have a small satellite on top of a big rocket with a lot of extra space because you've designed with margin. Um, we thought about it and we came up with this idea. We called it the Nanosat Launch Adapter System. And really what it is is it's this fat disk um, that you can just put underneath your satellite and it sits on the disk and then the launch vehicle sits underneath it. And then within that disk, you can kind of hollow it out and you can put these dispensers, a whole bunch on this side and a whole bunch on the other side. 
and I'll show you what that actually looks like. And we call that the wafer, and then the blue box, that's the gold thing. The wafer's the, the gold thing. There's this little avionics thing, the dispenser that just fires a sequence to open the doors when it's appropriate. And then the blue boxes are the dispensers. And this is called the NLAS system. Uh, we actually designed this and we released it, open source, so to speak, the open design, I guess, is a better model um, to any uh, US vendor that wants to make or use these things because that's going to increase the number of launches that are available out there. Um, and anybody, they can you know, create a whole economic unit of selling back and forth to each other. And we just benefit, because now we can go out and buy a whole bunch of these and don't have to build them ourselves. So what we're doing is, for the Edson spacecraft in particular, we get a launch on a, um, a new pseudo-commercial launch system called Super Stripey. Um, that Aerojet and Sandia National Laboratories are putting together. And it's actually going to launch from Kauai. Yes, I, I meant Hawaii, but the island of Kauai. Um, it's going to launch this fall. We can fit four, uh, four Edsons, which are one and a half U's. So you've got the one U you passed around, one and a half U's, 15 centimeters by 10 by 10. So two one and a halfs make three. You can fit four of them in a six U dispenser. And we can put two dispensers full of our stuff on one side of the wafer, and then the other side is being used by other, uh, other groups that are making use of the launch vehicle, and then there's the mainline Hawaii sat, what a surprise, uh, on the top. And that's gonna launch order November of uh, this year, and yes, I will go. So what are, the, what are the next steps for NASA, NASA CubeSats? I've talked a lot about basically just demonstrating the capability that we're kind of is being engendered by universities and other groups already. Um, I talked about uh, how we're doing it for space biology, how we're doing it for uh, down mass from International Space Station, how we're doing it for technical demonstrations. Some of the other things, you know, I leave it to the uh, community to look at and just think about, but. One of the things we also do is uh, we send these lovely deep space interplanetary spacecraft out there, right? We send the Mars Science Lab, the, the Curiosity rover, uh, out to uh, Mars a couple years ago. Do you think we did the same thing uh, with that spacecraft like we've done with every other one, where we maybe had a little extra volume and we maybe had a little extra mass all held in margin? Yeah, we did. And do you think on the interplanetary transfer stage that was throwing Mars rover at Mars, we also had additional volume and additional mass? Yeah, we did. Do you think we sent anything with it? No, we didn't. Why? Hmm, politics in large part, uh, but because people hadn't really thought of it. You know, the standard hadn't advanced enough, the capabilities hadn't advanced enough. Now what we're talking about is, as you send these spacecraft out, very expensive spacecraft with a lot of money and a lot of intellectual capability that are pretty much guaranteed to work as best NASA can make them, you send those babies out and with the remainder mass and the remainder volume, you send a bunch of little crappy CubeSats out. Not that crappy. You send stuff out that's probably going to work, but you don't have to spend so much money to guarantee it. And you don't send one, you spread your risk. You send 10 or 15. And what do you have them do? You have them do things that are unique to deep space that you can't do elsewhere. You have them measure the space weather, which is really how the sun behaves outside of the, you know, us, our one viewpoint on the planet Earth as we're moving around. You have it uh, check with another set of interesting biological payloads. How do they behave in deep space? We don't know. We have no flipping idea, okay? Lots of great opportunities, and we're launching stuff out there every year or so. We're doing a mission called um, ARM. I don't know if you guys have heard about this. This is kind of in play right now. It's called the Asteroid Redirect Mission. Uh, this is a NASA mission that's going to go look for potentially hazardous, hazardous objects, PHOs. We have to acronym, acronymize everything, which is code for a big rock that may hit the Earth. Um, and this is kind of a cartoony version of, you know, bag the asteroid and move it somewhere else or give it a little bit of a kick. Again, um, you can spend 
a couple billion dollars on this baby to make sure it damn near does exactly what it's supposed to do and does it to the 99th percentile. And then you send a small amount of money on sending a fleet of smaller, disposable, but reliable enough, uh, very valuable additional eyeballs to see what else you're doing from different venues, to measure the broader environment around this asteroid, perhaps to measure who knows what else you're doing in, in the area. So this opens up a whole different set of characteristics. For the down mass uh, uh, device I talked about from the International Space Station, this works out to be a very interesting way to get something all the way to the surface, maybe the surface of Mars or a Venus, a bunch of very small things, right? If you remember, we spent a lot of money, a lot of good money, uh, on uh, Curiosity, uh, the big one, and then on Spirit and Opportunity back in 2003, that was two and one. Why don't we send 50, right, all over the surface of Mars or all over the surface of Venus. Again, they're not going to be as reliable, but we're going to, if you lose three of the 50, um, you still got 47, I hope. So, just to sum up, NASA is really trying to make use of kind of this disruptive model, this CubeSat engineering capability that if you go to NG, any university right now, frankly, a bunch of high schools and, believe it or not, one elementary school. Don't, I don't know how they do that. Um, they're building CubeSats. They really are. Uh, they're building CubeSats, and we're going to fly them. Um, Ames turns out to be one of NASA's particular centers that's spending a lot of energy, time, money, effort, and intellectual capital to make use of these, demonstrating what can be done, developing the technologies to make it happen, and basically um, managing some of the programs that allow the, all the other NASA centers and universities to make use of this form factor. We're looking to partner with a lot of universities, nonprofits, uh, international space agencies, and companies, and we've done so. Um, Google bought a company recently, I believe called Skybox. They're not CubeSats, but they're small sats. They're microsats. Same idea, that same tech, type of technology, but a little bit larger form factor. Um, there's a lot of business going on in this area. NASA needs to figure out where we fit in this new world because of this disruptive change. Um, I'm very excited about it. I think there's a lot of capability that will be added by us being able to do it. Um, I think software is key here because that is what you can add as a capability that weighs very, very little but adds great functionality. Um, but it's a whole new world for us and uh, Ames is on the forefront of it. The rest of NASA is coming along. Um, I thank you for your time. Any questions? Uh, this is amazing. I, uh, I've been really interested in, in this area. I'm not a, uh, a rocket scientist, but uh, a hobbyist. Um, have you heard of inner orbital? Uh, no, I haven't. It's, a, um, it, it's, it's very similar to what you presented today. Uh, there is a, a CubeSat that you can buy for about $10,000 with uh -huh. the launch. There's a TubeSat that's the lighter version of it. Mm -hmm. It's for about $8,000. It's something that I'm really interested in building and launching uh, in January of 2015. Cool. And uh, I'm wondering, when you said that someone could get something like this and get essentially a quote-unquote free ride, uh, how free and how cheap would something like this be versus uh, interorbital? Uh, so I don't know what... I don't know what interorbital does. Do they provide launches? Is that, is that what yes, they do? Yes, the kit and the launch. <clears throat> so uh, there are a number of groups out there. There's Space Flight. Um, there's ISI, I know. There's Nanoracks. Sounds like there's a whole bunch more. Um, and really, uh, a lot of them are using the same launch vehicles and stuff NASA does. All that we've done is we've done a little bit of a bulk buy idea, where we know what's going up, and we put a dibs on every launch vehicle that some fraction of that is ours. And then we, um, we sponsor groups to go up. They have to be nonprofit, so educational or nonprofit or you know something like that. Uh, we're not looking to support a profit-making capability. Right. Uh, but it's really just a proposal process. You go to the, the NASA website, you find CubeSat Launch Initiative. Every six months to nine months, we release a call for proposals. You write up a proposal. Uh, you tell us what you're going to do, convince us you actually can build something that's of value, and you saw our uh, our acceptance rates on the order of two-thirds. Okay. 
Uh, so, so you're saying that it's free if you get accepted? It's free if you get accepted. Okay. There's worse things. <laughs> My question is about the R mission that you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, so we are also looking at uh, using six U CubeSats to uh, actually impact the asteroid yeah. as a kinetic impactor. So my question is that uh, how much can we actually deflect the asteroid by using six U CubeSats? That's a zero. Um, uh, but why would we do that? Um, since I know where you work. <laughs> I can answer that question. Um, it's the same reason, I don't know if you guys remember, back in 2009, NASA Ames had another mission called LCROSS, Lunar Crater Observation Sensing System, lovely acronym. We smacked into the south pole of the moon into a deeply shattered crater and blew up a bunch of junk. Why did we blow up a bunch of junk? Because we couldn't see into the permanently shadowed crater, permanent shadow. Um, so we had to pop it out somewhere where we could see it, where it was illuminated. Mm -hmm. And then we were able to basically turn our spectral analyzers on it and see what was the chemical composition of it. That's why we do it. We blast into it so that something would pop off that we could take a look at. Yeah, so my question is, uh, what uh, uh, frequency do they, uh, the antennas uh, uh, use? Use, yeah. OK, so right now, and this, that's a great question because that's getting tricky. Um, these were started as university <clears throat> activities. So what we actually ended up using was the ham band. Anybody remember ham radio? Ham radio operators are all over the world and are serious, their own hacker community. Turns out uh, you put a ham radio transponder in space and pretty much anywhere on the world somebody's going to be listening if you tell them what particular frequency to listen to and they will find you. And we just squawk packets and then we, they email, them, email the packets back to us and we get the data. It's a great model. It's free. It's a great model. The problem is that was specifically only for uh, amateur band, amateur band operators. Uh, now that so many of these things are going on, and now that NASA is actually starting to play in this game, uh, the amateur band people are saying, hey, it's getting too noisy in our amateur band. Please get your own you know, band to play with. Um, NASA uses what's a, a couple bands, S, X, and KA band. If you're not an RF person, and I'm not, you're going to uh, I'll point you to an RF person, um, uh, but it's like 480 uh, megahertz is the ham band. Um, I d couldn't really tell you what X, S, and K, A are, but we're looking for different actual downlink capabilities now because of that. You know, there's an open sight glass on this thing. Yeah. Looks like there's a little reticle in there. I mean, was, is there a purpose for that? or? Uh, I couldn't tell you without seeing exactly what you're talking about. Oh, okay. we can, you can show me afterwards. Oh, yeah, there, we did put uh, corner reflectors. You know what retro reflectors are, or corner reflectors? They left them on the moon. They're basically, um, it's a box of mirrors, and if you fire a light at that box of mirrors, it will bounce oh, it yeah. directly back to you. Yeah, uh, and that is that's just a mirror. It's exactly right. It's a little re retro reflector. It's the idea that one of the things you can do is we're working with a group in Australia that's got a laser. It's a commercial-grade, big, whopping laser. And they're lasing our satellite and getting the bounce back. Um, that gives you what's called range. And you can also get what's called range rate, which is the rate of change of that range. And from that, you can get your position really accurately down to a couple centimeters. So that's the type of stuff we're playing with. Yeah, go for it. Is NASA buying uh, flights in suborbital commercial flights um, yeah. to, uh, to launch these uh, CubeSats? Not solely to launch the CubeSats. So, so we're, we, we have paid. SpaceX and Orbital Sciences and Boeing and you know Lockheed and all these guys to launch stuff for us. The U.S. government has, but we're launching the big sets. What we've done is we've, as part of that contract, we've claimed extra volume and mass, and with that, we're launching the cube sets. Eventually, the launch vehicle providers are going to figure out they can charge us for this. They have not yet figured that out. <laughs> Don't tell them. And what about uh, suborbital flights? You know, uh, X core is, is same is thing. planning to launch. We and have a, there's a thing called the Flight Opportunities Program, okay. which we will fly anybody's junk again as long as you propose. We fly our own junk, and we have to propose to that. And they're all suborbital flights, and we fly out of the Mojave uh, spaceport, which takes you up rather high, but doesn't get you in orbit. Mm -hmm. It's suborbital. Yep. Yeah, okay. Thank you. thank you very much. Appreciate the time. Let me know if you want to chat. <laughs>